a very good afternoon to one and all from Center for Arbitration and Research, Maharashtra National Law University, Mumbai. We invite you to a panel discussion on the new mediation law. It is yet to become the law, but I think it is the newness element, which is the focus. Mediation is always at the center stage as far as India is concerned. There have been many legislations wherein we have introduced mediation on ad hoc basis. And now we are at the cusp of revolutionizing the justice system because the fundamental way in which we imagine justice system is going to be changed. And I see this from the perspective of both legal profession as in the practice as well as teaching profession. Because what we have been doing till now, we have been teaching 50 papers on the adversarial model and only one or maximum two papers on the collaborative decision making. And this is also true with the advocates. If they are dealing 50 litigations, on 50 litigation, they are dealing with one mediation. So, at the first instance, what such new kind of law does is help think parties in, in an innovative ways or at least in a way which is not adversarial or which is not litigative. So how do we think and how do we reimagine the discourse around dispute resolution vis-a-vis -vis litigation, dispute resolution vis-a-vis -vis mediation so that we can encompass also collaborative decision making in the kind of either mediation advocacy training we are talking about, legal students training we are talking about, or mediators training we are talking about. So it is from that perspective, we have introduced this knowledge session on the new mediation law so that we can understand the nuances of this law and how it is going to change the ecosystem of mediation. And to help us doing this complex task, we have set of wonderful experts in form of Dr. Aman Hingorani, Mr. Jawad, and Dr. Anirban Chakraborty. Ms. Iram Majid will also shortly join us. Uh, Anirban, let me make you co-host so that you can unmute yourself at a later point of time. So I'm, I'm not going to make, you know, big formalities in terms of making big introductions. I'll straightforward come to the business. Mediation Bill 2023 has 11 chapters, which are spread across 65 sections and 10 schedules. This law aims to create a favorable mediation ecosystem in the country. It is in this respect the law has created framework for the Mediation Council and it also emphasized on mediation institutes, mediation service providers, need for accreditation, training and empanelment. So while we always had laws relating to mediation, which permitted mediation, which also enforced settlement agreements, it is for the first time we are creating a favorable ecosystem to promote mediation. That's the point number one. Second thing, the term mediation under law has been defined in a very broad term. I will not go into what it entails. Probably panelists will explain it, but it does away with a very, what we could say, illusory distinction between mediation and conciliation and adopts the definition of mediation which is in line with ancestral model law. Second, the law also defines international mediation and by and large, it has the same scope as in ancestral model law on mediation, but like there is a difference between international arbitration in model law as well as in arbitration act. Similarly, there is a difference in international mediation in the model law and the international mediation as it is defined in the mediation bill. 
And one of the fundamental difference is that in the model law, parties can, irrespective of territoriality, say that we agree that our mediation should be international. So broad party autonomy has been given, but Indian law does not have that. I'm not commenting whether it is good or bad. We have lived with this uh, regime as far as arbitration is concerned. Third important point we need to keep in mind that though arbitration and mediation are distinct modes of dispute resolution, mediation bill has the hangovers of the arbitration law. And I will give you two examples. Like arbitration agreement is defined in the Arbitration Act, mediation agreement is defined in the mediation law. There is no definition of mediation agreement in the uncitral mediation law. This is point number one. So what happens because of this, um, why, why do we need the definition of a mediation agreement? Especially under Arbitration Act, if the parties do not arbitrate, there can be a referral to the arbitration. But under mediation law, there is no referral to mediation. There is referral to mediation, but only in the context of pre-trial mediation. So we create a distinction as far as referral is concerned between pre-trial mediation and mediation, which initiates on the basis of mediation settlement agreement. But what is the purpose of such mediation settlement agreement if the courts are not binding parties to that referral? For your information, there is a similar provision of referral about mediated a mediation agreement in the uncitral model law. So I think this is one of the major differences because when I say hangover, there cannot be an arbitration without arbitration agreement. But as far as mediation is concerned, mediation can very well happen without arbitration agreement. And this is recognized in the next section to mediation agreement, which talks about pre-trial mediation. Pre-trial mediation does not require mediation agreement. Then the next point we note, we need to note about mediation law. Law encourages pre-litigation mediation, but does not make it mandatory. So it creates a different regime from the Commercial Courts Act, where there is a compulsory pre-litigation mediation. So compulsory pre-litigation mediation under Commercial Courts Act for specified value survive, but as far as mediation law is concerned, this is voluntary. Now. There is a list of mediable and non-mediable disputes, which I'm sure panelists will uh, explain. But one point I want to bring to the attention is that there are disputes which can be mediated with the permission of court, such as compoundable offenses. So not all disputes are voluntary for the purpose of mediation. Compoundable offenses can be mediated, but with the permission of court. And then there's another category, say, for example, motor accident. Motor accident, if the settlement does not work, then the tribunal can refer parties to mediation. So it is the reference by the tribunal. There is no automatic or voluntary mediation in those matters, but reference by tribunal and even the settlement agreement, be it the case of compoundable offense or be it the case of accident cases, will have to be approved by the court. So even with respect to the treatment of settlement agreement, it will depend upon what is the source of mediation. Is it a court annexed mediation? Is it a mediation for the compoundable offense, or it is just a private mediation, though the bill does not use the word private mediation. Another important point, which I would like to draw to your attention is, mediator cannot act as an arbitrator. So this has important implication for MEDARB, which is a hybrid mechanism. Now this is good. Mediation should not act as an arbitrator, but what uncitral model law has done, it has left the autonomy with the parties. That if the parties want that their mediator should continue as an arbitrator, there should not be a problem. So that's where we make a departure. Good or bad, I leave it to the panelists. And the last point, which according to me is the most concerning point for me is section 19 which talks about mediated settlement agreement 
which is void under Indian Contract Act shall not be deemed to be lawful. So if you create a mediated settlement agreement and under Indian Contract Act, that is void. Now, where does the problem come? Most of the mediation, what happened? One of the settlement term could be that we are deciding that one of the party will not approach the court. So this will be an agreement in restraint of legal proceeding. Now, Section 19 is making such kind of settlement agreement as void. Now, a mediation bill has made amendment with respect to Section 28, but they have made amendment only with respect to saying that if the parties decide that they will mediate, it will not violate Section 28. But they haven't discussed that if parties in their settlement agreement decide that one of the parties should not sue the other party and that's why I'm paying you compensation. This is, uh, this is unlawful according to section 19. There are many more layers to this bill, but as a prelude, that, that's where I would like to stop and I would like to invite Dr. Anirban for his comments on the mediation bill. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, sir. You are audible. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chirag. Uh, firstly, I like to congratulate Dr. Chirag and uh, Maharashtra National Law University for taking, uh, and, uh, sorry, Maharashtra National Law University Mumbai uh, for taking this lead, uh, you know, not just uh, now, but in several, you know, uh, earlier events also to organize this kind of wonderful conversations with some, you know, real experts in the field uh, on this kind of contemporary and extremely, you know, significant uh, legal you know, matters. Uh, I think uh, I also thank for inviting me and giving an opportunity to, you know, uh, learn more than, uh, you know, discuss because uh, I think there are, you know, many experts who are there today present uh, who will be the speakers, uh, you know, they have much more better insight and depth uh, to, you know, talk about this than me. Uh, I will be also a learner and benefiting from this program. Having said so, thank you for, uh, you know, giving me this opportunity to share a few, you know, uh, points. Uh, I have been uh, an academician uh, and uh, practicing some aspects of mediation, largely, uh, you know, when I have been invited by uh, certain institutions uh, to mediate in some disputes, which they have largely high courts and district courts and legal authority. Uh, my experience in mediation has been principally, practical experience and principally, uh, in non-commercial matters, so I don't have much experience in commercial mediation. But I have been teaching mediation for almost now uh, 10 years, and I'm teaching ADR for almost now 17 years. And the reason why I'm saying I teach ADR for 17 years and mediation for 10 years, because when I started teaching ADR sometime in 2005 or 2006, uh, we only used to do a lip service on mediation or other non, you know, adjudicatory forms of dispute resolution, which are totally coming part of this ADR framework. Our focus, uh, you know, had always been arbitration. Uh, oh, it's only last few years that we have slowly gained some insights. And <laughs> it has been largely over last five years development where we have some jurisprudence also which has developed. So uh, as a teacher, now I have some contents to discuss about mediation. And uh, very interestingly, the Bar Council of India has now introduced a compulsory paper on mediation, uh, which should, uh, mediation and ADR, which should usually not include arbitration. And uh, I have been responsible to teach that. And I have to say that, you know, the jurisprudence is there. Uh, and also, you know, added with the skill training. Now, this law is, 
am going to i mean i'm 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 sure is going to add one more you know layer to this academic as well as practical dialogue of of this important you know system of discussion now in today's world <laughs> with the cohort where we are discussing today there is no point of discussing about the significance of mediation we i think we all know and we all accept whole heartedly that the future of dispute resolution if it has to come up with uh, you know more effective access to justice then mediation has to be the way of it but unfortunately you know in this country mediation dialogue or mediation discourses have been limited to show mediation's advantage only to you know it carves Uh, you know, it is making expenditure inexpensive or it's uh, speedy, <laughs> which is you know, in my opinion, nineteen eighties or nineties what uh, you know Americans used to discuss. But today, mediation's advantage is not just limited to this nominal you know values like it is inexpensive or it is uh, expeditious. Mediation has much much more than that to give, and uh, mediation has. the ability and it's probably the only dispute resolution where disputants go out after resolving their problem with what i call a healing touch so mediation is the only dispute resolution which gives you a healing touch but the only problem that you know some of the parties have shown or apathy towards embracing mediation more is some legitimacy deficiency and this legitimacy deficiency has been largely argued because of lack of having more legislative backup now this is also a product of adversarial mind what my you know goli chirag said to start with in his introduction because we know we are teaching law and both of us know Out of fifty courses, in forty-nine courses, people are taught, you know, how to fight in court. And one course, they expect that we will train our students to a completely different mindset, you know, problem solving. So it doesn't happen. So it has to be a concerted effort of creating a set of professionals who will understand the legal profession not just from an adversarial perspective, but Legal profession from a problem solving perspective. In this problem solving, mediation or adversarial dispute resolution can come equally, depending on what is the nature of the dispute and what the disputant wants, and what is the best manner in which most effectively we can solve the problem. So accordingly, we have to develop our ethics. We have to develop our ethics. We have to develop our academy. We have to develop our institutional setup. in that light this uh, bill and now parliament giving its assent i'm not sure whether these are received president's assent but definitely both house has given its assent to the bill so this is a major development in this field and i'm sure those who have been talking about the legitimate legitimacy deficiency or legitimacy uh, you know about mediation this is going to have some kind of a response to that and look now we have a legislation which is trying to create some kind of a formal act also this legislation is important because it is a time when the international development is in full swing <laughs> it's not that we have a ancestral model most importantly we have a international convention which is for the purpose of recognition and settlement of settlement agreements arising from mediation and it's probably first time a contract mediation settlement is nothing but a contract a international legal framework for the purpose of enforcement of this contract it's a great step and in that light india being a signatory to that convention 
to strengthen the mediation system and increase the popularity of mediation, bring more legitimacy. The mediation law is obviously a great way forward. Now, the process through which this law went has been also quite a long run. So, presumably, probably, this is one law which actually went through a lot of public discourse. In October 5th, I think the first time this bill was brought to the public notice. And the first, uh, you know, what I can say, a very effective and a very practical and academic critique of this law came from one of the eminent analysts of today's session. And uh, he wrote how not to draft a law on mediation. Is that piece was really a great, you know, uh, sort of a material on to start with the critique. Of course, he said that he has few points he discussed and he said that details can be many more and I'm expecting from him some more insights uh, on some more of these critical issues now. After that, we saw a series of discussion dialogues. Of course, I did not wrote anything individually but I was party to a number of national institutions I and mean, national law schools uh, who had, uh, you know, ADR societies who also <coughs> submitted clause by clause critique of that uh, 2021, you know, uh, bill. Uh, and to the Parliamentary Standing Committee was appointed, detailed report, and then a lot of that went. So it is expected that this law is going to show an important way forward. I'll just uh, take few of the provisions of this law and I will not make any critical comment. I'll reserve that for the, uh, you know, experts uh, and maybe later I can say, uh, but few things I want to say uh, about the, some provisions. First is application. This law is applied to domestic mediation, to court annexed mediation to international mediation. And it has also provided Is it just me who can't hear you? Or? Uh, I think we've lost this connection. As an organizer, I am always worried my connection should not be lost. It's fine if his connection is lost. <laughs> he can always join back. Hello, are you still with us, sir? Uh, we have to again make you co-host. Give me a moment. Uh, no, okay. you are still co-host. Yes. Am I, am, I, am I audible now? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so this, last thing we heard from this you. One, what I say, international mediation definition, right? Yeah. So this is one of the suggestions of the parliamentary standing committee to align it with the Singapore Convention. To so some effort, it seems that has been there. <laughs> then the agreement. What is a mediation agreement? Now, one thing that is important to note that. Uh, you know, there has been a dispute for some time that whether an agreement to mediate is enforceable or not. Now, one solution that courts have given is that the mediation agreement or such agreements, if it is in the form of a multi-tech dispute resolution clause also, should be in writing and should be well framed. So giving an opportunity to make mediation agreement in writing brings definitely some kind of a enforceability, legitimacy to mediation agreement. And it's not that somebody just think that, you know, this is not something so serious. Uh, you know, we will any point of time go to arbitration. Let me be there to satisfy someone. That will not be any more the case. Then the definition of mediation, again, I uh, go back to what uh, Dr. Hingorani has mentioned in his piece, that this artificial definition that was made between conciliation and mediation to just statutorily, you know, uh, 
overcome that problem that section 99 and you know uh, other laws were causing you created through jagannath rao committee this uh, you know artificial definition difference between conciliation and mediation and it existed so this law for the first time <laughs> has acknowledged that is that there, there is no difference which we have been saying for long more or less it's the same process is just an approach difference maximum but technically, there is no difference, but so this has been overcome, and I think that's a very welcome step. Also, I'm sure uh, Amon sir will be in a better position to comment more on that how he thinks it is done. Then, uh, you know, two points that you raise: mediator cannot be arbitrator. Yes, it's a very important aspect, but at the same time, waiver, you know, in those countries where you know this is there. Now they are using the waiver. So the moment you enter into a metola or a metal clause, you're actually entering into a clause where you're giving either the mediator the power to return on the arbitrator, or you are actually here a scenario where the person will record the arbitration award first, try mediation, it fails, it comes then pass the award of the arbitration. So in both cases, it is my view, uh, I may be wrong, but it is my view, that the act has taken there, probably intentionally or unintentionally, a scope of waiver. So parties by entering into a mediate a nebula or a metar, which is specialized agreement, is by agreement waiving that uh, a problem or, or that uh, restriction. But otherwise, for generally, it is a matter of ethics. And I think a conciliation act also has this. <laughs> and I've seen whatever limitedly in other countries' legislation also. Uh, there is a provision that you know a mediator in subsequent proceeding cannot be any arbitrator or anyone, any other engagement he can have. Uh, but I have a serious concern on this, you know, subjects to be not amenable to mediation. Because we have seen this arbitrability horse, you know, I, I call it a un, you know. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's it's that untamed horse, and what havoc it has created in global jurisprudence, and especially in the opinions of the Indian Supreme Court. They are still, uh, you know, not able to completely come up. One day, Supreme Court is saying this is transfer of property is not arbitrable. Another day, it is saying transfer of property is arbitrable. <laughs> One day, fraud is not arbitrable. Then, less serious fraud is arbitrable. More serious fraud is not arbitrable. How do you differentiate? Nobody knows. So, same with arbitrability also, the argument has been that set the appropriate scenario determined, but parties should be given the first opportunity because it's an autonomy-based system. Parties are choosing it. So, why are you restricting it unless there is a compelling public policy? And I don't see in Schedule 1 a lot of uh, matters which have been kept out of the domain of mediation actually has those compelling public policies behind it. Second, of course, I do see the benefit of having a detailed agreement. But that, as well as the interim measure, the extreme circumstances interim measure, I see a opportunity of flooding of litigation. So the, I like to end this, my part, with this one small concern that we required this law and I'm sure this law will benefit. But only concern that I have at this point, which can be only answered after probably five, ten years of the working of this law, that hopefully this law does not judicize mediation or judicialize mediation. You know, then what, at least what we have now, without a law. So that's my only concern, and with a positive hope that we will understand that mediation's beauty and benefit, I like to rest my case. I like to listen to others more. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Renevan. Now we move to Iram Majid. Iram, have you joined? Yes, obviously yes, yes. you have joined. Can you please turn on your yeah. camera? So yeah, yeah. I, I hand it over to you. Please share your comments on the mediation blog. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, 
lecture for giving me this opportunity and a very good evening to all of you my co panelists and i could see my students also <laughs> yeah so today i am going to give uh, the comments on the bill and that is the key features i have to discuss so uh, as all know that this is a very significant and a milestone in the indian legal landscape and this legislation reflects a progressive shift towards efficient voluntary and mutually agreeable dispute resolution with the provision catering to a party autonomy government matters reduced timelines community engagement online platforms and institutionalization the bill is poised to bring out transformative changes in the way disputes are settled promoting harmony and expediency in the pursuit of justice so with this i would like to highlight the key features which according to me i feel are the are the very very uh, good steps in in securing justice through mediation so the first provision which i would like to highlight sir i i have the ppt also but i think that that will take the take away the charm of the discussion so i will be just uh, telling the provisions and with the provisions provision wise we will be discussing about the key features so section 5 and section 29 so i feel that these are the major provisions which talks about the party autonomy so the party autonomy is the is the is the is the, is the main feature for the for the mediation and uh, if you see that uh, earlier it was we we talk about any of the provision so mediation party autonomy was also there but in the previous bills which we which were before uh, uh, rajya sabha or before before them so it was considered that it should be mandatory so the provision was earlier it was mandatory when then before the parliament committee we have discussed this and we we gave our recommendation and many of us will they they gave the recommendation with regard to that the mediation should not be mandatory then now by virtue of section 5 and section 44 24 the act provides that the party can exit any time and party can opt any time irrespective of whether there is a mediation agreement exist or not so if you don't have mediation agreement you don't worry about it that whether you cannot go for the mediation if you have mediation agreement then it is fine if you don't have mediation agreement even then in those cases you can opt for mediation it is a part of autonomy you are you are voluntary you 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 can decide what time you want to go for the mediation and you can decide decide at what time you can exit from the mediation so the mandatory provision which was discussed in the two previous bills now it has been taken away in in this act so this is the this is the great steps with regard to the party autonomy now the second feature is with regard to section 2 and section 49 which talks about the government at and its agencies so earlier if we see in the previous bill which was placed before the before the parliament before before the you know lok sabha so it was it was mentioned that the government cannot be the party or the the or in the disputes where the government is the party the mediation cannot be done in those matters because there was a lot of apprehensions if the suppose the 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 government officials if they are making any 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 submissions or any uh, you know any position so that may not be uh, that may go against them so now there is a there is a provision under section 50 also where whereby you can see that they are protected so the protection has been given to the government officers and the government uh you know uh disputes that can come for the mediation but that is only with regard to the commercial in nature so if any dispute which is commercial in nature and the government is the party then they can opt for mediation so what i feel that why we are we we are just ex just limiting ourselves for the commercial dispute there are other disputes also like the welfare uh, the, the public welfare disputes like the environment disputes and other disputes that can also be resolved through mediation but in mediation act if you see section 49 so the act extend the scope to include government and its agencies to mediate in the commercial matters and also expanding the application of the mediation in the wider range of disputes so this is what the uh, you know the the new steps which has been taken by this act and it was not there in the previous you know bills which was there it was a very uh, very uh, i must say encouraging steps with regard to the mediation and we have large disputes which are pending with regard to the government and if it is in commercial nature then we are able to resolve those dispute by way of mediation now the third thing which i would like to highlight is the timeline so the timeline in the previous act previous bills which were placed before the parliament the timeline was you know 180 days and 60 days but now that also be further reduced 
as per section 18 the act says that the total timeline to conclude the mediation proceeding is 120 days which may further extend to 60 days with the consent of the parties but not more than that so what does it mean? It provides the strict timelines to conclude your mediation. See, that is something which 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 gives the party a, a hope that yes, my dispute can be resolved in this limited time. Otherwise, there was no timeline fixed. Though we were doing mediation under conciliation and we were doing mediation under arbitration section 30. But, but the problem was if suppose if section 30, we were doing mediation, then again, it was one year. And if we were doing conciliation, uh, you know, as per uh, from section 63 to 81 onwards of the Arbitration Act, the timeline was not prescribed. But now the benefit and the key feature of this act is that there is a limited duration as per section 18. So now 120 plus 60, so that is 180 days. So maximum time limit to complete your dispute or to complete your mediation rather is 180 days. So this is a great steps, which I, I say is a great features rather. So another thing is that the community mediation, and that is chapter 10 and section 43 and 44. And before I would like to, uh, before I'm going to discuss about the community mediation, let me tell you one aspect that uh, in 2020, I wanted to do my PhD. And then I opted community mediation. And I, I sent my SOP, a statement of purpose under the community mediation. And I told them that I want to conduct a research in the community mediation and I feel that this is a good uh, area where I can contribute a lot and then they said there is nothing called community mediation which exists and you cannot do your PhD in community mediation this is this is just uh, four years ago and my PhD was refused <laughs> I feel shy also in telling you all these things and my PhD was refused but but let me tell you that I was very happy when I see the new chapter altogether in the on the community mediation that is chapter 10 in the in this act which shows me and give me confidence that I was right at that time but maybe the people did not understand the concept so um, the community mediation of the act introduced that the community mediation offering and avenue for settling dispute within the local communities, but the settlement agreement is not binding. See, this is the beauty of mediation that if you have any disharmony, any any you know sort of uh, conflict within your community, you can resolve it with mediation. But let me tell you, the position was in previous two bill that the community mediation until and unless you will not resolve the dispute, you cannot go to the court. You you were you were restricted to go to the court, but now. In this act, that was taken off, that, that is taken away. So now if you are involved in a community mediation, if you invoke the community mediation, that does not mean that you cannot go to the court. And also if settlement agreements is, is the byproduct of that dispute, you know, if you settle the dispute within the community and you resolve it and you have a settlement agreement, that settlement agreement is not will not be considered as a decree. So that is the beauty of the community mediation. So suppose if you are resolving dispute within your neighbor, within your community, within your RWA and all, so that will not be binding and that will not be having an effect of the court judgment. So and I feel that now, is suppose if I will be giving this SOP to any university with regard to this, that I would like to conduct my, my PhD in community mediation, I think that could be regarded. The most important thing is mediation council now. So the mediation council is again a great feature which has been discussed in chapter 8 section 31 to section 39 and and this is this provides for the establishment of mediation council to regulate and promote mediation ensuring adherence to the standard and accreditation of the mediation see mediation council of india is a body that body will be taking care of uh, you know uh, of all the mediation which will be happening in India, and uh, also not only not only uh, the mediation, but also with regard to the trainings, workshop, courses, and in the area of mediation, the kind of collaborations, the mediation service providers about the law firm, universities, and other stakeholders, both the Indian and international. And also, uh, you know, it can it can recognize the mediation institutes and mediation service providers and renew, withdraw, suspend, or cancel their such recognition. So what does it mean? So this body, having this such kind of body will be like an umbrella and under which all the institution will be 
uh, will be recognized and will be grading and service provider will be recognized by this body. So that means that it will be a regulatory body and the entire practice will be now regulated. So that is a very great step that with regard to uh, mediation law that the mediation council under section 38, it talks about the duty and the function of this council. And also if you, if you see the mediation council of India, the, the, the main purpose is just not only to, to give the force to the court and next mediation, but by this council, it, it recognized the private institutions and the private practice. So everybody have a lot of a scope after having this Mediation Council of India, and it will be, you know, uh, I think that it, it, is a, it is again a great step. And this Mediation Council of India can publish, uh, you know, certain uh, information, data research, studies, and other information which is required. So far, it was a problem in India that we were not having good research with regard to mediation. We were not having any kind of repository. So now with this council, they allowed that there should be repository, and then there will be a lot of research material or data available to all of us to conduct uh, you know research so uh, with this uh, again i would like to highlight that that uh, um, uh, beside mediation council what i feel is section 27 this also a very uh, uh, good steps which we were doing mediation under section uh, 73 and 74 arbitration act and section 30 where we were making consent award, but now we are having section 27 of uh, this uh, mediation act, which talks about the binding mediation agreement. So this act provide the mediation agreement can be enforced like a court degree and enhancing the enforceability of the settlement. Beside this, I would like to highlight one more aspect that is confidentiality. So the confidentiality by section 22 that establishes the confidentiality as the backbone for the smooth and neutral functioning for the mediation and to the extent that the communication within the mediation cannot be admissible as evidence in any court proceeding, including arbitration. And as mentioned about the, uh, the Mediation Council of India Depository, there is again another provision that with regard to registration of mediation settlement agreement, and that is section 20, that provides that for the registration of mediation settlement agreement, but the parties are not obliged by the registration, it did not impact their right to enforce the agreement. See, these are the few key features which I feel to highlight here in this. So what I mentioned so far is that, that, that there is the party autonomy which can, be, which can be intact in present act, government agencies and government and its agencies, limited time, that is 180 days with extension, community mediation, and one more thing, the online dispute resolution also. Section 30 includes ODR provision reflects the act modern approach that allow for the mediation settlement in the digital realm. Then I told about the Mediation Council of India. I discussed about the bindingness of the mediation agreement, section 27. I discussed about the confidentiality, section 22, depository in section 38N, registration of mediation settlement agreement under section 20. Perhaps there are certain lacunas also, which I feel that could be uh, addressed by my co-panelist, but these are the key features which I would like to highlight. So if, uh, uh, I think that uh, Chirag, uh, uh, after Dr. Anirban, so this was my two cents of contribution towards it. Thank you. Thank you, Iram. Uh, always pleasure to note your comments. Now we move to Dr. Hingodani for his comments. Mm, thank you, Chirag, and a good evening to everyone. Um, we have had at least three versions of the mediation bill. And this seems to be the most evolved of those mediation, uh, those versions. There are portions, um, there are sections, as, as Laurie pointed out, that the parliamentary committee had recommended and they have been accepted. For example, the definition of mediation now is more robust. It ensures that the mediator cannot impose a settlement. So if you see section 3H, that's a definition of mediation, which has been uh, strengthened by bringing those clauses in. 16 clause 1 talks about, uh, the, specifically says, the mediator shall not impose a, uh, a, the decision, rather than saying the mediator may not impose the decision. So those things have been rectified. Crucially, 
uh, as Iran pointed out, pre-litical mediation is no longer mandatory. Restoration of a settlement agreement is no longer mandatory. Um, you have uh, other provisions of which the standing committee had recommended that you do need to do something about the distinction between court and next mediation, local dollars and private mediation. For those who are familiar with the case law, the Supreme Court had treated a court and next mediator in Afghan's judgment to be a local dollar complete with powers to summon witnesses, record evidence, and that's something which is inconceivable in mediation. The mediation bill had perpetuated this. This version now says, uh, has deleted that provision in section 57, simply said that till regu statutory regulations are made by the medical uh, mediation council under section 15, um, you would, the, the current situation would continue, the court rules will apply, but it is now for the Mediation Council to prescribe regulations by which the court and ex-mediations will be run. Court and ex-mediation ex centers are now our mediation service providers. So this particular version does away, once these regulations are framed, we don't know when they'll be framed, but once these regulations are framed, uh, there will be uniformity at least on the status of a settlement agreement, whether arrived at a court and ex settlement uh, mediation center or in private mediation or in other institutional mediation uh, pro, uh, circumstances. It will be interesting to see that in that situation, does, the, do, does that particular matter go outside the stream of litigation? So because if a court is referred a matter to the court and ex mediation center, and the regulations say, well, they'll be treated like a private, should they say, they'll be treated like a private mediation. Would the parties, do the parties not now need to go back to the referring court? So we'll have to see what regulations come out. But that this is one change, which is a welcome change. Um, but let us see what regulations eventually um, uh, formulated by the Mediation Council. These are the positive sides, but these are easily outweighed by the negative sides. Even this mediation law, in my view, is defective for many reasons. To start with, it again does not deal with non-commercial international mediation. It does not provide for Singapore Convention explicitly the way the first version had done. It does not again permit mediation in some kind of criminal matters which are petty. For example, check bouncing, and so on. It's a blanket exclusion that no criminal matters can be referred. There's a difference between a heinous offense like murder, rape, that cannot be sent for mediation. But there's also a difference between petty offenses that can go for mediation. Even the most common matrimonial offense, 498A, which is not compoundable, according to this version, they retain it that it cannot be sent for mediation. So a chunk of matrimonial cases go out. You have a time limit. I still struggle to understand why do you need a time limit? If you if the bill is essentially on private mediation and it's a voluntary process, parties can choose to mediate if they want to for two years. What's the problem with the government? If there's a property dispute in mediation, parties agree to sell it. You had something like COVID come in and you can't sell the property for two years. Law says you have to terminate mediation. Why? If the parties are willing, mediators willing, what's the problem with the government? How does it affect them? So why have a time limit at all for mediation provided if the one party feels mediation is being dragged, he'll walk out of mediation. You don't need a provision for it. But we have retained that provision. We have maintained the distinction between mediation in private setting, in court setting, and in local dalits, again, for no reason. We have maintained the a ridiculous state of affairs that a settlement agreement in community mediation is not a decree of a court. Then why would anybody go for community mediation? What's the advantage of community mediation? You make people go through a process and say, it's not enforceable. Why would anybody do that? You have perhaps the most, uh, you, you've retained online mediation 
without clarifying that is it only virtual mediation or is it also using the blockchain technology, artificial intelligence? Are we talking about smart contracts, which include mediation uh, proposals to um, appoint a mediator, giving predetermined access to the mediator to code in a settlement agreement if there's any use of virtual currency? You talk about digital rupee. But what is the impact of online mediation in that sense with other statutes? Again, this complete silence. But perhaps the most damaging part of this particular bill is the confidentiality. If you go to section 23, and if I open it, on one side it says that a mediator cannot be asked to disclose anything, etc. There's a proviso which says that should there some should the mediator to be be misconducting himself, there's a malpractice, then this provision won't uh, this provision won't apply. But if you read the language, it says that professional misconduct or malpractice is during the mediation. If it's during the mediation, the mediation has to be terminated by the party. There's a question of letting a mediator misconduct himself during mediation, have a settlement agreement, and then, or no settlement agreement, and then make a complaint that during the mediation, the mediator had misconducted himself. It just doesn't make sense. Section 23, clause 2 says there'll be no privilege or confidentiality if there's somebody's going to say there's a threat or a statement or a plan to commit an offense, or there's going to be an imminent threat to public health or safety. Terminate the mediation. What does the connection or relevance of confidentiality with these situations? They, I mean, nobody's really thought this through. And then again, there'll be no privilege or confidentiality uh, that will attach to information relating to domestic violence or child abuse. Now, this, I think, destroys mediation for family matters. If the role of a mediator, if you go back into the basics, if the role of a mediator in certain kind of cases where emotions are involved, is to basically get into the mind of the parties, break the conflict cycle, make them step back from the problem, do restorative justice to heal them. A party will disclose the innermost vulnerability, the innermost thoughts, only in the cloak of confidentiality. Only when they are assured that whatever you see, we say will not go to a court, only then they will say, yes, perhaps I made a mistake by raising my hand on my wife. Nobody is going to lower down the defenses and let a mediator help them do a self-analysis and get the alternative perspective without assurance of confidentiality. Almost every matrimonial case will involve domestic violence. The way the DV Act defines domestic violence, it is so wide, whether it's economic deprivation, emotional uh, abuse, physical abuse, any kind of discomfort, if you want to put it, can be touted as domestic violence. If information relating to domestic violence or child abuse is not kept confidential, then people won't go for mediation. Why would they want a mediator or anybody else or even the other party to, to record something and give it to the court? It's a futile exercise. For child abuse, you had Perry Kangsagra's case of the Supreme Court, which in my view was wrongly decided. There an exception had been carved out that a guardian court is parents patriae, that is like a parent of the child. So should some information be available regarding um, the state of affairs in the house, how the child reacts, how he, what he thinks, his wishes, his relations with his parents, then that can be communicated to the court. So there's no reason, because according to the Supreme Court, there's no reason why a guardian court should not have access to material from every source. Now, what the Supreme Court has overlooked is that a mediation is not a discovery process. It's not expert opinion uh, uh, gathering process. A person is coming to mediation, even when there's a matter of child abuse, to see if they can 
resolve the matter amicably in the cloak of confidentiality. If a party feels that the mediator or the child counselor will report everything to the court, and that judge will then use that material against that party, he will simply not bring the child to the mediation center. And should the other side go to the court and say, tell him to bring the child to the mediation center, you're bringing an element of coercion that mediation is doomed to fail. You can't force people to mediate. So the trend which I've already started noticing across the board after Peri Sangra is the minute mediator says bring the child, parties terminate the mediation. Nobody trusts the nobody wants to get involved in such a situation where information given during mediation can be can be communicated to the court. The court must do its own job as parents spectra independent of mediation. They can't use mediation proceedings to get information. So this is going to, it is already damaged. This, these kind of judgments have already damaged the mediation as far as family law is concerned. It has been expanded by this version. It was there in the earlier version also. That information relating to domestic violence or child abuse, which will be there in almost every matrimonial case, there'll be no privilege of confidentiality. So you have taken out criminal cases by virtue of Schedule 1. You have taken, by virtue of these provisions, matrimonial cases won't come in. A last chunk of what we have in mediation, well, there's no incentive for, and community mediation, there's, it's not enforced by the decree of a court. What are we left with? A handful of matters here and there which will uh, which is uh, not going to take the mediation movement very far that apart perhaps yet another aspect where i think the mediation law as it once it comes into force um, is silent where it could have done more is laid on ethical standards it does talk about in section 10 on conflict of interest it talks about in section 38 that the Mediation Council will prescribe one of the powers is to lay down standards for ethics, um, also for registration or cancellation of accreditation of mediators. And then you do have statute regulations that can be brought in by virtue of Section 55, um, 52, I'm sorry, on uh, these ethical standards and having disciplinary powers, etc. But what where the lacuna seems to be is that we still don't have a debate in this country about what is the nature of practice of mediation. Mediation is a practice of law, but it is not only a practice of law. Anyone can be a mediator. So suppose you have a child counselor who's a mediator, you have a charter accountant who's a mediator, you have an engineer who's a mediator, whose professional standards are going to be followed. As a lawyer mediator, I cannot solicit work. As a chartered accountant mediator, I can solicit work. If you need to have an interdisciplinary standard of, ethical, uh, of ethics, which has to be laid down, that debate has not even started. All that we're talking about is conflict of interest. So it is too little. In, and this is something that can't be left for regulations or rules. It can't be argued, well, let the medical, uh, this mediation council lay down in form of regulations or rules later on, what should be the ethical standards. There has to be a conceptual clarity as to who will do the regulation on what set of rules. Because the minute you say mediation is a confidential process, that means bad practices are happening within the chambers of the mediator in a private mediation setting. Who is going to regulate that? Or if it's by, by a mediator who's in a law firm, will the law firm be looking into it? If it's in the high court, or sorry, in a mediation court in next mediation center, whether high court or trial court, et cetera, who's going to regulate what happens within closed doors and on what standards? There's a complete uh, vacuum as far as the law is concerned. So to conclude, I'm keeping a track of the time. We are, we have evolved, as I said, from where we started. 
uh, the first version talked about it being permissible to do audio visual recording. We have come a long way. Uh, uh, most of the defects which I had, which I pointed out, including the defect, for example, on challenging of a settlement agreement. The earlier version had said you can challenge it on grounds of fraud, coercion, impersonation, the mediation not being a suitable one. It should be just on an excluded topic. You don't need to wait for a settlement agreement to see it's on an excluded topic. Coercion and impersonation are parts of fraud. You don't need a separate heading for that. When it comes to fraud, fraud unravels everything. False, uh, the fraud nullifies everything. You don't need limitation for it. But even if a limitation is prescribed, it's always on the date of knowledge of fraud. Earlier version and this version still says that you can challenge a mediated settlement agreement on the ground of fraud within 90 plus 90 days, 180 days in all, from the time you receive a certified copy of the settlement agreement. So I receive a certified copy after eight months and it is on the face of it fraudulent, I can't challenge, challenge that particular settlement agreement. Is that that basic proposition of law that fraud, you, you, A, you can't have limitation and even if you do want to prescribe some kind of outer limit, it has to be done from the date of knowledge of fraud. So the, according to me, this mediation bill, I mean, it was pointed out my, when the first conservative draft had come out, my article was how not to draft a mediation bill. When the circle, second last, the bill came out, um, the last version, I said how still not to draft the mediation law. And I was still say how still, still not to draft, how to draft a mediation law. Because this mediation law is not going to uh, I would say mainstream mediation as, as, as we need to do it. On the contrary, while we have brought in the party autonomy and voluntary nature that was missing in the previous bill, we have retained provisions which take away the confidentiality clause of mediation. So that's my views on it. I'm sure um, there'll be many takers, there are different perspectives on it. But then that's, I mean, this is the way I feel about it. Thank you, Chalab. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dr. I would Hingurani. like to add what Dr. Haman Hingurani has mentioned with regard to the limitation uh, with regard to the fraud. So there is one more point I would like to add what uh, I would like to supplement. Say, suppose if the fraud has been committed and the parties are going to challenge it and let's say it is in the court and the court set aside that MSA. So that period, let's say court took five years to set aside. And then the person after uh, after having everything dissolved and they want to invoke their remedy, then they they, they will be losing their you know cause of uh, this this uh, this cause of action, and that then it will be barred by limitation. So that exclusion is not there in in the act. See that that what we have in section forty three sub clause three in arbitration act. So that the entire exclusion period when you will be challenging the award and then the award challenge will be outcome. And then from that period to the award, invocation of the award, the challenge period that is excluded. But here that is not excluded in mediation. So that is what I would like to you know, supplement what Dr. Manhingurani has mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hingurani for your insights and Elon for your additional comments. Now let's move to our last but not least speaker, Mr. Jawad. Please share your insights, sir. Thank you, Chirag. Actually, the um, I don't know whether it's the advantage or the disadvantage of being the last speaker, but almost everything that you wanted to say is already covered by the previous speakers. So there is very little left for you. So I just want to take a different approach here. See, the one of the biggest problems in India has been that mediation has always been considered as an extension of the court process. Okay. And that mentality has always been uh, existing from the time we uh, brought in Section 89, we set up court annex mediation centers, and we started doing mediations. Uh, I was very hopeful, actually. I, I was all in favor of a separate law for mediation, simply because I felt that it will give it the necessary gravitas uh, and acceptability, particularly among the legal community, because we have this obsession with statutes. We want everything to be 
<laughs> absolute unless we have something which is uh, not laid down by the legislature we don't accept it we don't give the kind of seriousness that needs to be given to it but the you know but that militates against the whole concept of mediation itself after seeing the act now in its present form and i don't want to go into the defects because aman has really pointed out in graphic detail what are the problems here with the act i don't want to repeat that my feeling is the the act in its present form up uh, except giving legitimacy to a mediated settlement agreement enforceability rather is actually doing a greater disservice to mediation than if the law had not been there at all so i really wonder why we ever wanted to have the mediation act on hindsight because i have uh, you know where when uh, i think some some where where aman had spoken about why do we need this act and even when he wrote it i actually disagreed with him i don't know whether i conveyed that to him or not i don't remember that but i disagreed with him i felt we should we do need to have an act simply because only then people will start taking it seriously but you know considering the way the 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 mediation process itself has been uh, understood under this act uh, gives rise to a serious doubt whether the drafters of this act really had any idea about what mediation is all about and i think we need to understand that first okay why mediation now what we have today are uh, the the dispute resolution process that we have today the concept of justice that we have today is entirely based on an adversarial system which you also pointed out when you made your opening remarks right we teach the adversarial system we practice the adversarial system and that hangover has continued even into the mediation act forgetting the fact that this is a completely voluntary process as aman pointed out anybody can walk out of this at any stage the moment the moment they feel that you know there is some violation or there is some uh, something unfair or something is not right about it, they can always walk out and nobody is going to hold them accountable for walking out of the mediation yeah. process now even if this act had made mediation mandatory it is like the proverbial taking the horse to the water now no law can mandate parties that you have to settle in mediation it can only mandate that you can go for mediation but whether they choose mediation or not is completely in their hands they can always walk out of the process if it doesn't suit them and that is what was happening even under section 89 under the afcons judgment supreme court said it is mandatory for you to refer parties to mediation if you are not referring record reasons for that so court started referring but parties always had the liberty to come to the mediation room and tell that look i am not interested sorry i don't even know why i was sent here send me back so they had that liberty and even if this act had made mediation mandatory they would still have had that liberty so where is the question of uh you know bringing all these provisions that aman had already pointed out okay so that is the biggest challenge now why you see first of all let us understand what mediation is all about and i'm sure the experts here will agree with me when i say that it operates on a completely different paradigm okay see we have 5 crore pending cases we have 14.5 judges per million population whereas us and uk have something like 150 or 200 or something like that okay we have we, it is going to take us 348 years according to niti ayog to dispose of all the pending cases provided no new cases come now all these are problems but those problems have come because we have only used one method for dispute resolution and niti ayog also says that almost 97% of justiciable causes don't come to the court at all simply because people don't have any faith anymore they don't want to spend their precious time and money on pursuing a court proceeding which they don't know how it is going to end and when it is going to end so mediation is not required just to answer that problem mediation is required because it is basically 
a, a cultural maturity of a society. Okay, so in a mature society, what do we do? We have a problem, we sit, we talk to each other. Now, because we are victims, we are human beings, we are victims of our emotions, we are victims of our biases, we bring in a third party who can take a bird's eye view, a balcony perspective of the whole issue and help us to discuss with each other, understand each other's interests and resolve the problem. Right? It is as simple as that. So we don't need a complex act with 60 sections or more than 60 sections and about 10 schedules to really, you know, uh, make mediation as an acceptable way of dispute resolution. Okay, it should be a cultural revolution that should happen where people real should realize that, okay, this is not the only way. You don't have to necessarily go to a, somebody for a decision, but you can go to somebody for assistance in resolving a dispute. So you have the ability to sit and talk to each other and resolve a dispute. So in a completely voluntary process, where is the question of bringing in all these provisions of regulations and all that? And today we have a mediation council which does not accommodate a single median. Right? Tell me, I don't know of any professional body, even the Bar Council of India is run by advocates. With all the problems, all the challenges that Bar Councils have today, but still, it is run by lawyers, not by some bureaucrats who are nominated by the government. So why do we have a why, why do we need a mediation council? And will that mediation council have that wisdom or sagacity to understand what is actually needed? Or will it be something like this ham-handed act that has come into force? Right? So th these are the challenges that are there before us. Now in any case, now we are, we have the act. Okay, at least let's say that we have the act now. This may sound contradictory to what I said earlier, but we do have an act now. And there are, as the other speakers pointed out, there are there are many benefits in this act also. Okay, one, it gives a definition of who is a mediator, it gives a definition of what is mediation. So that you know, people know that if they walk into mediation, what can they expect out of it? Hitherto, that was not there. People did not know because there was nothing to guide people as to what was mediation. And it also makes a mediated settlement agreement. It gives some sanctity to it. It is not just a contract. It is equal to the decree to a decree of the court. So to that extent, yes, it's a very good thing that has happened. So what is going to be the future of this? How it is going to work out? Will all depend on what kind of regulations are framed? What will be the constitution of the mediation council? How we are going to be uh, what will be the standards of accreditation of mediators? All these questions. Now, mediation has, uh, you know, can be used in various contexts, which community mediation, as Aman pointed out, is one of them. Now, I, we, it, it's simply incomprehensible why a mediated settlement agreement in a com community mediation is not enforceable. Because what happens if there is two sections of people fight over a right of way? And there's a mediation and there's a settlement that is reached between them. Why can't it be given the kind of enforceability that other mediated settlement agreements are given? So there, there is a lot of vagueness in certain places. Right? But the, the, the problem with me is I'm a hopeless optimist. Okay, so I want to see the good things about the Act. I don't want to see the bad things about the Act. So as Iram pointed out, there are many, many good things about the Act also. So at least people are now sitting up and thinking that, okay, mediation is some serious business. So way back about, uh, you know, 10, 15 years back when I decided to make mediation my career, my friends laughed at me. They thought I'm, I'm a kind of an activist, tree hugger kind of character who's, who, who has some, uh, you know, uh, misplaced ideals, right? But my argument has always been that there is a jurisprudence behind mediation. So that jurisprudence traces itself back to the natural law theory of the Greek and Roman Stoics and to our own concept of dharma, which is righteousness. So basically, essentially, in mediation, what we try to do is we help people to understand what is right and, you know, uh, from not necessarily a legal perspective, because what is legally right and wrong may not be morally right and wrong. 
So sometimes in mediation, morality may play a very significant role. Because morality guides how you feel about the whole situation. Right? So that, sadly, I feel that that aspect of mediation is not recognized under the Act. Okay, it, it just treats mediation like any other process of dispute resolution, like arbitration. Like, for example, it mandates, there, there's a contradiction. It says that, you know, a mediation agreement should be in writing and somewhere, uh, another provision, as Iram pointed out, it says that whether it is in writing or not, you can still go for mediation. So why do you make it mandatory to have uh, be in writing in the first place? And where is the question of a time limit? Again, See, even in court-referred mediations, 90 days is the maximum time that is given. But we have done mediations for nearly six months in such cases also. And the court has just kept quiet and allowed us to proceed with the mediation simply because the parties needed more time. Right? Basically, it's a party-driven process. Let's understand that. It's all about them. It's not about us. It's not about lawyers. It's not about judges. It's not about arbitrators. It's not about mediators. It's about the parties. So we are giving them an opportunity to come there, sit there, talk to each other and try to find a resolution. All we are doing is helping them to understand each other. As simple as that. So why do we want to complicate it is my question. Now, as regards the future, I feel that, you know, just to quote my friend Radhika Shapurji, mediation is an idea whose time has come. Let us just accept that. Because we are bursting at the seams now. People are totally disgruntled with the whole system. They want better ways of resolving disputes. We want those 97% of justiciable causes that don't come to courts to also come to some legitimate way of resolution, which mediation offers. And Mediation Act legitimizes mediation completely. So I'll just stop there. Okay, because I know everybody must be tired. <laughs> On more than this. No, thank you. Thank you, Jawad. In fact, I'm also like ever since the debate started, should we have a law or should we not have a law? I was always of the opinion that the beauty of mediation lies in being it party driven, being an informal system which is disassociated from state. But when state enacts a law on a subject like mediation, it, it, it is bound to do or it is bound to create these kind of problems. But even when we create a law in mediation, because when the member of the parliament who was introducing this bill and whenever it is introduced in the parliament, they say this is the backlog of case. This is the burden on the court. So clearly they see mediation only from one perspective that how do we abdicate our most fundamental duty of dispute resolution through the state instrumentality and by putting it again back in the hand of people. So when we look at mediation as a mode of dispute resolution, we miss out a very important point that it, it is a life skill. As far as business is con concerned, it's a business enabler, not a dispute resolution. As far as personal lives are concerned, it is a healing process. Unless no law, I think, can encapsulate all these points. I, I don't know if there would be a law which could say mediation is there to enable business and not just resolve dispute and in matrimonial or personal dispute, it is for the purpose of healing, right? And if this philosophy of jurisprudence is understood, I, I probably we can fix the law to a larger extent. But I think this is the right time we allow our participants to ask some questions. So please, those of you who are interested. Uh, I, uh, uh, I just wanted to make one small yes. intervention. Uh, uh, actually, I, <laughs> uh, as an opening batsman, I thought ki after this magnanimous event of one law has been passed, uh, be a little bit on the safer side and play, you know, uh, more defensively. Uh, but I uh, I completely agree that you know this law with what it has been after we do more service uh, than service even being extremely positivist uh, positive 
frame of mind about the law. <laughs> and I, I just wanted one small comment. Uh, I, it's just a reminder, which uh, many things, you know, uh, Aman said, which he wrote, and I still remember. One thing he said, that we have this awkward habit in India <laughs> that always think about new law. We have a conciliation act. Today we are repealing it. But why not we think that it can be somewhere because commercial mediation is what we largely has to streamline. If even if the legitimacy is streamlining, the need of law, commercial parties, commercial mediation is where largely that. So why not we explore, uh, you know, that if conciliation act can be a way of dealing it, then having a new law which will create more hodgepodge. I, well, you know, I, I personally feel we spoke about ethics. Uh, you know, of course it is missing, no question. But, you know, when we talk about ethics, I think for mediation, we need completely a new ethical model. <laughs> it cannot be anybody's ethics. Any professional ethics can be adopted. It should be completely new thought about model. Now, for us, conflict of interest means uh, you know, if we represent another party where needed, I have never been able to understand that in Section 13 the application of Hindu Marriage Act, when only one application is required for both parties, why you require two lawyers to draft it? I have still never understood it. The only answer is if there is one party, one lawyer, it will be conflict of interest. Now, <laughs> this is how our adversarial ethics are also developed. So mediation needs also a complete rethinking. And if we are leaving that, you know, not addressed, then I think one of the purposes of the law is lost at the very outset. Yes. And yes. I think 1960, 1940 Act all had its problems. But 1996 Act, because it was not a thoughtful legislation, but a copy, it did not reduce but added the problem. So this mediation act may not actually reduce but add our problems. So we have to be really, you know, concerned and we have to also, you know, revisit what, you know, recourses are we, we have in order to deal with this problem. Shamnath Bashir, one of my ex-colleagues, late, uh, he used to say, trips agreement, initially, the third world was thinking that the first world has won against us. But after the Doha agreement, we saw that we initially tripped, but we later on tripped it such that first world was gold down. So here also, I think now it is our turn to do something, you know, to make this law workable. So that innovation is somewhere required. Otherwise, the law as it is, it will be a <laughs> problem for all of us who are, you know, either in academics, teaching mediation, or those who are doing mediation. It will be a big challenge. I just wanted to add this, you know, few small remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ranirban, for bringing out your inner critique. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Ethelbard, uh, you have a question, sir. Can you please unmute yourself? Okay. Uh, my issue with the bill is, can, am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. My issue with the bill is, what is the link, missing link? You see, in mediation, we have three parties. We have the disputants, we have the mediator, and you have the council. Now you have a mediation council of India, which does no focus on the mediation advocacy. We need to train councils in mediation advocacy. We need to have ethics between the practitioners of mediation advocacy. We need a regulation to regulate just like how you have bar council for advocates, bar council for mediation advocacy, including the training and the focus. So therefore this act, should have utilized this to bring in another stream of practitioners also to be developed. And this is something that I find uh, a glaring um, thing that is missing. Very well said, sir. 
very well said. Any further comments or questions by other participants? Chirag, can I just respond to what uh, Ethelville said? Can we take question by Pankaj? And then we can uh, take both the responses together. Sir, I just want to know, uh, can a mediation council, can be a private limited or a limited company? Or for example, uh, if somebody wanted to set up a mediation center, whether it can be a company, or it has to be a trust or a section at company, whether it can be a commercial organizations like private limited company? Pankaj, you sound like a company secretary. Are you? I'm company secretary as well as lawyer. Both. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Pankaj. Yeah. We'll, we'll respond to your question. So, yes. Whomsoever would like to respond to both Mendeji and Pankaj. Yeah, I think to Pankaj, what I believe is that it can be a commercial enterprise. I mean, it can be a private limited company. It can be a law firm having mediation as one of its verticals. Uh, it can be a limited liability partnership. It can just be a law firm. It can be anything. It need not be a Section 8 company or a charitable trust. And to Ethel World, I would say that uh, I think mediation advocacy will develop on its own method because now that we have a law on mediation and lawyers will now sit up and take a look and say that, okay, here is somewhere that we can still make some money. So they will start, uh, I think, focusing on mediation advocacy. And as Chirag uh, and Anirban also pointed out, the universities will have to uh, start including problem solving as a part of the curriculum, not just problem inflaming which is what the adversarial process does. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff. So once we develop that mindset... I, in, among, in fact, uh, just uh, responding, just responding yeah. to that, my issue was why there was a need is because like the Advocates Act and the Bar Council, it regulates practitioners. The mediation yeah. contemplates non-professionals from the legal field to also be available. And therefore, if tomorrow we know that even as mediators, we have engineers, doctors, lawyers, we have uh, psychologists who come in as mediators who may thereafter end up as mediation advocates. And that was the, in that large scenario I was looking at that the bill should have also covered this aspect. The making the rules and regulation is reserved by Mediation Council of India. So, Mediation Council of India will come up with certain rules and regulations. The power is there. So, so if you if you read Mediation Council of India, it's it's a very um, very very the embed in the scope is very wide. So, the rules and regulation can be made on this time to time. The Act does not define mediation advocacy. That's what I was I was hoping to find. Yes. Any further? What did the okay? Any further questions, Linaji? Would you like to take up this question? Procedure for registration of private mediation center with mediation council. These rules will come out when the mediation council will be set up. Anthony asked questions about made provision for the unethical conduct of mediators. So, Dr. Raman highlighted that there are no ethical standards. Then, this question by Rakhi is not clear. How to become a certified mediator? We can definitely organize a separate session on that. Iram is very good in that. So, I think that that's where, if there are no questions or comments, that's where we would like to stop. All the panelists have their camera on. May I please click a picture? Thank you. On the count of three. One, 
two, three. Dr. Amit Kashyap opened the camera, but his video is not visible. So it's creating a black spot. I have to fix that. And give me a second. Yes. So perfect. I think it was an insightful session on the mediation law and we don't want to as an institute keep it to the discussion. We will formalize all the points which have been stated here and we will share it internally with all the speakers and then we'll see how we can either publish this or at least present it to the government though it whether it will make any uh, good cause or not uh, is a second question because I understand all these suggestions were given before the parliamentary standing committee. But our job as an educational institute is always keep making an attempt or intervention. So thank you, every, thank you everybody for joining on the Friday evening. I, I hope that now you have an excellent weekend. It was a wonderful session. And I again thank our panelists for the day, Dr. Raman Hingorani, Jawad, Anirpan Chakraborty, Iram, and special men mention to Mr. Ethelwald, uh, joining from Goa, even on <laughs> Friday evening, like Anirban is joining from Goa. So, but what a pleasure. So I'm, I'm, I'm not joining from Goa. I'm currently at I am but I'm from okay. Goa. So, yes, yes. So, thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> yes. And we would look forward for a piece from uh, Aman Ingolani, sir, on how to draft a mediation law instead <laughs> of <laughs> only to be put on the death list. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar, sir. Thank you.